All right, we're in Matthew chapter 16 this morning, and we're going to just go ahead and stand. We'll read, and then it'll be a little bit before we <clears throat> come back to our text, because I kind of added something this morning going through my mind that I, I hope you can see how it fits. <clears throat> and uh, But anyway, let's read beginning in verse 21. Now, uh, Matthew chapter 16, this is where Jesus was with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, and he asked them, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they gave their response to what they had heard. And then he said, But whom say ye that I am? And it was a definite shining moment for Simon Peter when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The central truth of all the Bible is who Jesus Christ is. God came in the flesh. And Jesus uh, commends him for that. And said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, revealed this unto you. And then he talks to Peter and uh, talks about the authority and of uh, the church. And, uh, and then, uh, anyway, verse 20, I don't have time to get into all the background. Verse 20, then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Which sounds very strange to us, but we'll give a little explanation of that in just a little bit. Verse 21 from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. We probably should pause and think about what astounding, shocking words these were to the disciples. Because they were not thinking his death at all. And that's evident when Peter says in verse 20, or when it says in verse 22, then Peter took him, means he took a hold of him, physically laid hands on him, and began to rebuke him. You can tell that shining moment didn't last long. <laughs> Isn't that right? Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and say it. Follow me. He is called them us to be followers. Followers. I think it was the 10th anniversary of Heartland. Uh, the directors and all thought it would be good if I'd preach the uh, commencement, which I was happy to do. And I preached, we are not training leaders. Brother Copes mentioned this yesterday in meekness. We are not training leaders. Our aim is not to train leaders at Heartland Baptist Bible College, but followers. And how Jesus translates that to leadership, that's his business. That's his business. But you, you are not succeeding if everybody sees you as a leader. You are succeeding if you are the right kind of follower. And Jesus said, take up, uh, if any man come after me, will come after me. You want to follow me? Come after me. That's the definition of follow. You want to come after me? Then here's what is required. Deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Thank you, Father, for your precious word. Please, Lord, once again, we beseech you. We call upon you and ask for your guidance, your help. And make this a profitable time. We are to redeem the time for the days are evil. We want this time to count. We want it to mean something. We, we, we mean, we, we desire, oh God, that it affect, that it be effectual. It affects hearts and lives and, and our outlook and our surrender, our yieldedness to you, God. Help us now and give us, a, uh, may you have our attention and May your Holy Spirit so work that our attention would be arrested. 
Lord, and that you would bless and get glory to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> Uh, I want you to go also, now hold this, but go to 1 Timothy 6. I want to show you something in 1 Timothy 6. Now, I'll, I'll read here in just a little bit. But in 1 Timothy chapter 6, I want you to have that ready. <clears throat> now, if you'll let me talk to you here a little bit, and, and please follow along. It may not, this may not be the attention grabber and thing that uh, maybe we should use, but here, here this all just kind of came to me this morning. I wanted to uh, relate it to you and show you hopefully how it fits in what we are talking about here. It was uh, in the 1980s, in fact it was 1984, that an organization was formed that's had a great impact upon, quote, church life. Now when I say that I'm using the broadest term. So I, I understand the difference in what I'm saying, church life and a local New Testament church. I understand that, but I'm talking about how it is normally commonly used out here. And uh, this uh, institute that came into existence was called the Barna Institute. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. It didn't start out being called the Barney Institute, but that's what it developed into and what it became known as. And even though it's changed ownership and everything, it's still known as the Barney Institute. Another one came out in 1990, I believe it was Brother Copes that mentioned it yesterday, called the Pew Research Group. And uh, the Pew Research Group, uh, they have a broader purpose than the Barney Institute. Barney Institute has basically to do with church life, what they call church life and church growth and keeping a thumb on the pulse beat of what is going on in society and what is going on in church work and church life and basically saying if you're going to be successful and if the church is not going, the church, the big picture they're thinking about, is not going to continue in decline then you've got to be aware of these things and so they try to make people aware of what is taking place. Pew Research is again more broad but they do do a significant amount of work in the religious realm as well and in the church realm. Now <clears throat> that uh, started with the Barney Institute in 1984 and then the Pew Research and there are others, there are many others that you could make reference to. These are probably the most renowned. And their research showed that with every changing generation that churches must adapt or the decline will continue. Decline meaning the lack of interest in the Bible, the things of God, church, uh, Jesus, religion, and on and on. So if you don't understand every generation that comes along and therefore adapt, then you're going to lose out and the decline will continue and you can only imagine through the process of time that there would be the demise then in the United States of America of the church as we have known it and America would become like Europe. And uh, by the way we are headed that way as a country but not necessarily for the reasons they think or that they're saying. So when they came out with these uh, statistics and this research and polls that they took and such as that, then church leaders uh, got a hold of this because everybody was concerned about the decline, including many in independent Baptist churches uh, because the evangelicals jumped on this and, and the charismatics jumped on this and then a lot of independent Baptists thought, yeah, well, we, we can't afford that. We better get with it and understand and, and know what every generation is expecting. And so as a result of that, we have today the generation issue. In fact, uh, I, am, uh, I am about six months, four months too old to be called a baby boomer. And the baby boomers were those starting from 1946 and on, those of that generation. And so I, I would be on the very uh, edge of the baby boomer generation. 
Somebody says, well, baby boomer generation. Yeah, come on, just think about it a little bit. I don't have time to go into all the explanation. The baby boomer generation. And, and so this generation, they talk, here's where their thinking is, and here's what they expect, and here's what, they, uh, here, here's what it's going to take to reach the baby boomers, or here's what it should have taken to reach the baby boomers. And then uh, that's followed by other generations. Until now, let's see, I forget what came after the baby boomers was the baby busters, all kinds of nonsense. Every generation so, uh, had to have some kind of identity. Uh, you are in the Z generation for the most part. Now there are some that are in the Y generation or what they call the millennials. And so the millennials are those that were uh, now, are now about 25 to 39 years of age. That's called the millennials. And the reason this is important is for marketing and to understand how that the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, millennials are thinking and what their expectations are. And they tell all the marketing world, if you don't understand this um, generation that is 25 to 39 years of age, that's where most of the money is going to be spent in the coming years, and if you don't understand what they expect, you're going to miss out. They won't spend money on you. Or uh, if you as a church don't understand the millennial generation, then they're not going to be interested in your church. You better understand them and adapt accordingly. Now, most here, again, are in the Y generation or what they call now the, um, no, no, the Z generation. You know, somebody says, why Z? I don't know. It's all stupid to me. But nonetheless, and I, you shouldn't use stupid in the pulpit, but if you do, this is a good place to use it. All of that, <laughs> uh, all of that is nonsense, in my opinion. So they talk about this uh, Z generation. That would be those born from 19, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, from 1996 to 2015. And so that would be most of the student body, you would be in this Z uh, generation. Now, they say, if you don't understand each generation, then you will lose them, you will not be able to attract them, and they won't have anything to do with you. So that's why, if you ever wonder, whatever happened to churches in the United States of America? Why is it that, and, and we're talking about those that might have had some semblance of the New Testament model. We're not talking about everything that has church over the door. Some of them haven't been remotely close to having anything to do with being a New Testament church to begin with. But we're talking about, just for our purpose today, we're talking about those that had some semblance uh, of, a, uh, of a following the model of the New Testament and, and maybe even being an authentic New Testament church that now are not even recognizable, not even remotely close. What happened? Well, they bought into that, and they made all of this kind of adaptation and uh, said, well, this is what they expect, so we've got to change. And you can imagine the things that they would change. Well, you've got to change because they're not going to put up with the kind of standards that some of the old legalistic churches used to have and stuff like that. They're not going to put up with that. They're not going to put up with this music that doesn't uh, fit the culture and where they are and what they prefer. And then you got to change the, your approach to preaching, this in-your-face, finger-pointing, clamping your hands, stomping, spitting, sweating type of preaching. <laughs> no, they're not going to accept that at all. You will drive them away. You will drive them away. And so then, and, and your doctrine, you, you may have a doctrinal position, but just kind of keep it to yourself because it really doesn't matter. They're not interested in that. And uh, the Bible version issue would fit in there. And so they're looking for something they can understand because everybody knows you can't understand the King James. See? And so that's the mentality and that's the attitude. Uh, I had you turn to 1 Timothy 6, I think. And so, would you look down in verse 11? Verse 11, you're going to wonder what this has to do with Matthew 16, and I'm working hard to make sure I don't forget myself. But this just came to me this morning, but I, I think I can show you. Look down in verse 11. But thou, O man of God, Paul said to young Timothy, but thou, O man of God, flee these things, talking about worldliness, ungodliness, talking about the love for money, 
thinking about worldly matters, living for food and raiment and money and things and stuff. Verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Stop right there. Basically what Paul told Timothy is, live the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we are in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Basically what he's saying here is you live the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, you, you might consider this sometime. Do your own reading and study of the Sermon on the Mount and then read the New Testament letters and see how often the influence of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount shows up in their writing. And there are those who say that the Sermon on the Mount has to do with kingdom living and it doesn't have anything to do with this generation now. That's the biggest bunch of nonsense and cop-out I've ever heard in my life. Then why did Peter bring it up? Why did Paul bring it up? He wasn't even there when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. He wasn't even saved. And why did John bring it up? I'm just saying, if you read the New Testament letters, you cannot miss the fact that they are strongly persuaded and influenced by what Jesus taught the Christian life is supposed to be like by the Sermon on the Mount. And so here's what Paul said to Timothy. Now watch this. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Don't stop. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things. And before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate, Witness to good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Timothy didn't quite live that long, but, but suppose he would have. Okay, now here's my imagination going here. What if God saw fit to let somebody like Timothy be ageless. And so he just lives on and on. So he left us one witness from nearly 2,000 years ago. And let's say Timothy was still walking around. Come on, your imagination, I'm, I'm asking for that. Imagine that he was still here among us, and of course we would have him come, and he would want to come preach chapel at heart. Somebody say Amen. What do you reckon he'd preach? Well, I, I can tell you almost exactly what he would preach. He would preach that we ought to follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, that we ought to fight the good fight of faith, and that we ought to be true. Now, hold on. He said, actually, this is all I know to preach because the inspired apostle Paul gave me this order that I'm supposed to do this till Jesus Christ comes. Amen. So the message I would have had in the first century is the message I have in the 21st century. And nothing would change. See? And, uh, and, and if you look on in verse 15... Well, let's read verse 14 again. That thou, shalt, uh, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Somebody say it. Amen. Amen. Wow, he got on a roll there, didn't he? Well, I, I see it. He did. I can just tell you right now, he did. Now, <clears throat> here's uh, what I gather out of that. Um, it is this, that uh, Timothy was not taught to be sensitive about what every generation expected. See. Now, I'm not against knowing what's going on. I'm not against that. I mean, all the years I was pastor, I used to subscribe to magazines like Newsweek and, 
and, uh, and let me see, what was another one? U.S. News and World Report, some of those things. You don't go to them to try to establish a position and, and decide how you're supposed to look at life and the issues of our country. That, you don't do it for that. But if you're a preacher and you're preaching to people, your congregation are exposed to all the stuff that's going on in our culture, you do want to kind of keep the thumb on the pulse beat of what's going on in your own society, in your own culture. We teach in the homiletics class that we preach in three worlds, that we are supposed to preach and understand, or we must understand three worlds, the world of the writer, we must understand the world in which we live, and the particular world in which every person in the congregation lives. And so I'm not against understanding and knowing. I don't think it's wrong for a preacher to be aware of all these generational things and what people are saying about it. It just doesn't have anything to do with how we approach uh, teaching and preaching and carrying out the work of the gospel. Amen. Because we are not interested necessarily in what every generation out here expects from church and from the pulpit and from preaching. We are interested in what Jesus the chief potentate and king of kings and lord of lords, we, we are concerned about what he demands. Yeah. See? So we don't shape our thinking and our philosophy and our methods. We don't shape them according to, well, what will fit? What, what would you, hello? What, what do you think a church ought to be like? Oh, okay, thank you. Write that down. Hello? Yes? Now, what do you think a church? Oh, really? Okay. Write that down right there. And now let's see. See what all the thinking is out here? Now let's make a church that suits everybody. That's insane. That's utter insanity. They're asking people what, are, what is expected of a church that don't have a clue what the Bible demands of a church. See, no, no, none at all. So again, I want to say that we are not, I'm not interested, and I think it's the thinking of our pastor and the president of Heartland Baptist Bible College as well. We might know what's expected. We might know what people are thinking, but we also know what Jesus demands. And the expectations of people is not what motivates us. The demands of Jesus is what motivates us. See? Okay. What does he demand? Well, what does he say he demands? We read a passage that says what he demands. If we would be followers, and that is what he's called us to do. Yesterday we talked about elevating our fellowship. Boy, that's a good title, isn't it? I mean, it's just amazing. But anyway, elevate your uh, fellowship. So we talked about what is involved in that and how do you elevate your fellowship. And so today we want to talk about the demands of Jesus in this matter of fellowship. So if you're looking for a fancy title again, I have one. Are you ready? Deny yourself. Now, it comes out of the King James. You may not know what it means. But anyway, uh, I think we can figure it out. Uh, because the next step of authentic fellowship, of authentic ministry that puts us in a position to exercise authentic ministry, the next step is this. Deny yourself. Somebody says, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't live in a culture and society that really wants to hear about self-denial. That's why we went through what I just went through at the beginning. I understand that. As a matter of fact, I might fill you in on a little secret. Are, are you ready for this? There's probably never been a time when fallen man has really been desirous to hear more about self-denial. I think it shows up pretty well in the Garden of Eden that self-denial is not what fallen man would be interested in. Oh, yeah, but this is this generation. Yeah, it's not a whole lot different than the last one. I said in these terms, it's not a whole lot different than two generations before. Yea, seven generations before, and on and on it goes. It's part of fallen, the fallen race in human man. But it demands. Jesus demands it. See, he comes to the disciples here, and he says to them, uh, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. If you notice, it said, in verse 21, from this time forth, 
began Jesus to show unto his disciples. So there's a certain point where Jesus starts talking to his disciples about it's not going to be all about miracles. It's not going to be all about the multitudes coming. It's not going to be all about coming the waters in the sea and opening the eyes of the blind. It's not going to be all about five loaves and two fishes and the miraculous uh, uh, feeding of the 5,000, which people were totally enthralled with and wanted more of that. Jesus said, it's not going to be about that. Huh, well, what's, what do you mean by that, Lord? He said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And when I go to Jerusalem, I'll be delivered into the hands of the scribes and the elders and those that hate me, basically, is who they were. And I'm going to be delivered into their hands and be killed and raised again the third day, which I'm not even sure they heard that. But that's what he said. And uh, that w when he said that, you, you just have to stop and think where they were to know how astounding this was to them. Because if you remember that all the way, now watch this, all the way till right at the time the procedures were starting for Jesus to be crucified, the disciples were in this big discussion about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven or who will be and who is going to sit on his left hand and who's going to sit on his right hand when he reigns. And clearly the disciples and most of Jewry that was exposed to the miraculous work and ministry of Jesus Christ and his teaching, most of them had expectations of deliverance of the Jews from Rome and the establishment of the kingdom, the restoration of Israel in the world. And they were thinking of reigning with Jesus Christ because surely soon everybody's going to recognize that he is the Messiah, that he's going to sit on the throne of David, that he is going to restore Israel to promise, Everybody's going to understand that, and we will reign with him. Now, who's going to sit on the right hand, and who's going to sit on the left? This became a matter of real contention among the disciples. Not by my estimation, it says so. There was stress among them. There was contention among them over this issue. And Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'll be delivered into the hands of the elders and the chief priests, the officialdom of Israel that hates him and that have wanted him dead for nigh on to three years now and wanted to do away with him. And Jesus said, I'll go there and be killed. And you wish that Peter's response was just born out of his sheer love for Jesus. But actually what happened when Jesus said that, the expectations of his disciples came crashing to the ground. Whoa, 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 wait, die, be killed, delivered into the hands of those people and, and be killed and die? No, 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 no. We're talking about who's going to sit on your right hand and left hand when you reign. Excuse me, they weren't thinking about some future millennium, friend, which is going to happen, by the way. But they weren't thinking that. They were thinking here. And now, and so was most of Jewry. If you read Matthew, uh, John chapter 6, and I believe it's verse number 15, that Jesus moved away from their presence supernaturally, lest they take him by force to make him king. I mean, this was the word. This is the Messiah. He is going to deliver us. If you knew the oppression of Rome, if we could understand that just a little bit even, then we'd understand why they were so excited about this. Rome made their lives miserable. Heavy taxation, awful suppression, and they wanted liberation from Rome. And they read about and heard about the glory days of Israel when she was the prominent nation in the world. And when the Messiah comes, yes, he's going to restore Israel back to prominence in this world. Yes, sir, that's what they're looking for. And Jesus said, I'm going to die. All the air was let out of their balloon, so to speak. Their expectations came crashing down. And Peter couldn't stand it. Oh, uh, no, no, not under my watch. This isn't going to happen. No, sir. You just said he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. Don't you think you ought to listen to what he's saying? No, it isn't going to happen. No, no way is this going to happen. And Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. You know what Satan means? Adversary. One who is an opponent of. And Peter wasn't the devil, for crying out loud, 
but he had made himself an opponent because he wasn't thinking of the things of God. As God revealed them, he was thinking as a man and what he saw, excuse me, and what he felt and what he was therefore expecting. And so when Jesus hit him with reality, he couldn't take it. And he said, no, 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 this can't be. This shall not be unto thee. And Jesus said, you need to get out of my face and get behind me. Remember, I told you to come after me or follow me, not tell me what I will and will not do. And as long as you're in my face as an opponent to the purposes of my father, you're an adversary. Yeah. So Jesus set him straight on that. And then he said in verse 24, Now Jesus said unto his disciples, Can I get you to look back up here a second? He had to redefine for them what it meant to be Messiah. Can I have your attention? They were thinking, if you'd have gone up to them and said, what, is it, what does it mean, uh, Messiah? They would have said, well, he's going to reign, obviously. <laughs> you can see that, I mean, even a guy like Nicodemus said, uh, we know that thou art a teacher come from God because no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So what does Messiah mean in the minds of the disciples? Reigning, power, the throne, glory. Jesus is thinking Isaiah 53, death, suffering, agony, pain. Dying. That's the difference. Now I like to ask it this way. If they didn't understand what it meant for him to be Messiah, which they did not. If they didn't understand what Messiahship meant, what's the likelihood they'd have a good handle on what discipleship meant? What does it mean to be Messiah? Reigning, power, glory. Liberation of Israel. What does it mean to be a disciple? Well, hello, they would say. Reigning, right hand, left hand, positions of authority and power. They've been being trained for this very hour. And they didn't know what discipleship was. So Jesus redefined Messiahship for them and then redefined discipleship for them. And he does it in verse 24. Look at it. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, that would be follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But that's not what we expected. Right. But this is what he demands. This isn't an option. This is not an option. If in fact we're going to be a genuine, authentic follower of Jesus, which automatically will put us in the ministry, whether you stand behind a pulpit or not, come on, we went through that yesterday. To be a follower of Jesus will automatically mean that you serve. You serve Him by serving people. In fact, I've, I've thought this out and searched it out best I can. Uh, there's not a way you can serve Jesus without serving people. What do you do? Serve Jesus. How does that play out? Well, me and Jesus, we have our own thing going. <laughs> no, you don't. He outlines, He determines what a disciple is. Uh, okay, but look at this. He said, then said Jesus unto His disciples, if any man will come after me, be my follower, let him deny himself. Think about this. Ministry. Minister. What's a minister? He serves. That's the long and short of it right there. You boil it down. And a minister is one who serves. And doesn't the very definition of ministry or minister, doesn't it kind of, uh, doesn't it kind of uh, collide with the idea of self-centeredness, self-will? Of course it does. Absolutely it does. 
Now, Jesus said, let a man deny himself. You know, do we know what denial means? I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but I'm just asking the question. Do we have a good, clear understanding of what it means, to, uh, what denial means? And we, and we probably do from another, you know, from one of the same characters that's in our account here. And the most famous denial, I'm sure, in human history has to be that of Simon Peter, who avowed his devotion and affection for Jesus Christ that he would go with him all the way to death. But one thing is for sure, I will never deny thee. And then he does three times. I know not the man. I do not know him. Cursing, saying, I do not know him. Wow. And we call it the denial of Peter. I wonder if we can figure out what it means to deny ourselves. The term actually means to affirm one has no acquaintance or connection with someone. Let me run that by again. Sometimes you hear the official definition, it's like different lights come on, you know. At least it works that way for me. To affirm one has no acquaintance or connection with someone. You are one of his followers. I deny having any connection with him. That's what he did. Further definition. To forget one's self, lose sight of one's self and one's own interest. Come on, you know I didn't make this up. I don't talk like that. This is the definition of the word. Now, to forget one's self, to lose sight of one's self uh, and, and one's own interest. That's what it means to deny self. So... How can, I'm going to ask this question. How can we have effective, authentic ministry and be at the same time self-centered? But I, yeah, yeah, but I, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, Brother Sam, but I, well, you need to hear what you're saying. See. Is this what Jesus expects? No, it's stronger than that. This is what he demands. Well, this is what I would like, but I'll take something less. No, he won't. This is what he demands. That we know what it is to deny ourselves, and the second part, that we know what it is to take up his cross and follow him. Now, come on, we know what the cross is. All we got to do is look in the Bible and see that the cross is an instrument of shame. Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, the law said. And so it is an instrument of shame. The most lowly, degrading death that anyone could die would be the death of crucifixion. And Jesus said, you need to, if you're going to be my follower, you, need, you must deny yourself and then take up the cross. Identify with the reproach of Christ. That's another. Ought to be a whole message on bearing his reproach. Because he went to the cross and took the reproaches, our sins, took the reproaches of all of us who reproached him. And then there are people that run around claiming to be his followers that say, well, I, I just didn't want to speak up there. Well, I, I know, but I was, afraid, I, I was afraid if I said this, people might think I was some kind of radical or something. Basically what you're saying is, I don't want the reproach of being totally identified with Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, take up the cross. It's an instrument of reproach and shame. It's an instrument of pain. Nobody's asking for pain. Read through the Scripture I love reading through 1 Peter in my Bible reading. Come to it about four or five times a year and come through 1 Peter and realize that in every chapter he talks about the suffering of Jesus Christ and that we are most identified with Jesus when we are called upon to suffer for his glory. That's when we are closest identified with Jesus when we are willing to suffer with him for him. Think about that. But I have to be honest with you and tell you, it doesn't make me go to my knees and say, oh, Lord, I want to suffer. Because nothing in us wants to suffer. Nothing in him wanted to go to the cross. I said there was nothing in him that wanted to become the sin bearer. There's nothing in him that wanted 
the, re, the, uh, the uh, defiance, the disrespect, the spittle, the buffeting, the cursing, the accusations against him. Nothing in him desired that. Nothing in him wanted to hear the sound of those hammers as his nails went into his hands and feet. So, yeah, suffering and pain. But Jesus said, if you don't take up the cross, you can't follow me. This is a demand. It's, a, it's an inst the cross, instrument of death. Well, if I take up my cross and follow him, die to yourself. Die to self. It's not like that's an... Uh, isolated theme in the writings of the Apostle Paul, for example, dying to self. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Crucify self. Paul said, I die daily. What does he mean he dies daily? He takes his will and puts it to death on a daily basis. That's the only thing he could mean. And this is what is demanded. Now, I just want to stop here and say, or maybe, yeah, say, let, let's be real practical here and see how does this self-denial and um, dying to self, how does that relate to authentic ministry? <laughs> well, it simply means that if you're going to truly follow Jesus, a lot of your dreams and desires may never be fulfilled. A lot of your wants and wishes may never come to pass. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I want to follow Jesus, but I want... Well, then you tell me what it means to deny yourself. I mean, I can't imagine, uh, I, I know my age, I'm aware of that, but so far I've got a pretty good memory. I can remember life, I, I had a wonderful life. I had a wonderful life, wonderful home. I'm so thankful for my dad and my mother and the way I was raised. I was the fifth out of six children. It was a little rough between two sisters, two years older, a year and a half younger. They brought about most of the emotional scars of my life. And so it was a little difficult uh, being raised between those two girls. But as a fifth out of six kids, I, I look back and I have, I've had a wonderful home life. And therefore, you know, growing up, I had a positive attitude. My dad and I had a wonderful relationship. I love my mother, maybe the best Christian I've ever known, perhaps. I don't know how to measure that. But my soul, she was a wonderful lady. I'm so grateful for that. But I had ambitions and desires. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I was into sports. My brothers played ball. My dad played football. He still holds the record for touchdowns in the high school he graduated from in western Oklahoma. He still has the record, seven touchdowns in one game. He used to run in county fairs and everything, outrun everybody and win prize money, and that's how he took care of his, uh, of his wife. For a, you know, for to pick up a few bucks here and there, and three kids. Till he got to where he couldn't run that fast anymore, reach about thirty, and things start changing, and something happens. Yeah, I, I, I love my dad. I love sports. I could see myself in a St. Louis Cardinals uniform. Easy, easy. I could see myself in a Boston Celtics uniform, who I despise and can't stand now, but I, then I liked them, Bill Russell, you know, Bob Cousy, that generation. And so, oh yeah, I, I could see myself. But when I got about a junior in high school and realized I had somewhat overestimated my abilities, <laughs> then I, I turned, I loved everything about the farm life. My dad was a wheat farmer, ran cattle, and such as that, and I, I loved everything about it except the chicken house, but nonetheless, I loved everything about the farm life. I loved it. Tractors, trucks, combines, harvesting wheat. The wheat harvest was, man, I lived for the wheat harvest. Couldn't wait, couldn't wait. I used to bug my dad 
to death almost and asking them, when do you think the wheat's going to be ready? Well, a, a day, uh, uh, it's a day less now than it was yesterday. And that's about all I could get out of him, you know, because I was so excited for the wheat harvest. I'd excited about wheat harvest. I know if you've never been there and you don't know what that's like, I don't expect you to fully understand that. It was just that season of year. Oh, it was awesome to ride on a combine, eventually drive a combine, to ride and drive and plow and do work in the field, tractors. Oh, man, I, I loved every part of it. I even like milking cows. We milked 30 cows every, let's see, 30 is what I told my kids. It was three cows. We milked <laughs> three cows every morning. Get up, milk the cows, do all the chores. I raised hogs, showed animals and stuff like that. I loved everything about the farm life. I did. I can be a farmer with my dad. And I, I don't have to tell the story. I don't have time to tell the story. But I actually had an opportunity from a very wealthy man that was a neighbor that had no children and was actually wanting to take me in to take over eventually his farming operation. He owned land, cattle. Obviously, it was an incredible opportunity. And I tried that Jonah thing, you know, running from God and the call to preach and all of that. You, and you can't run from God. It's about like Adam and Eve hiding in the garden. Like they can hide from God. Like you can run from God. <laughs> People are still trying. It's still impossible. Now, I remember starting in the ministry in Dell City, as Brother Gaddis mentioned yesterday, in 1967. And I missed the harvest of 1967 for the first time. I missed harvest time, being there with my dad and helping. By then, I was, could run the combine, do all the stuff, you know. And so I missed it. Well, it wasn't so bad because I was in school and working 50-plus hours a week. And I was married, you know, my first year of marriage. And so I had a lot going on. And I, I could, was far enough away. It didn't bother me that bad that first summer. The next summer, I was over here at Dell City. And a harvest was coming. And I learned then from the pastor that I was working for that was a childhood hero of mine, I learned this man demands uh, all in or you're out. That's what he demands. But harvest is coming. And I wanted so bad to be a part of it. So I kind of hinted around to him and said, uh, how, how about, uh, you know, my dad's getting ready to have harvest and instead of me taking a vacation later, could I just kind of have a week to go up and work for my dad? And, and uh, he could use a combine man right now. And w w you think that'd be okay? He said, no. No, you don't get a vacation until I say you get a vacation. Yes, sir. And, and I, I'm, I'm not proud of this necessarily, but I went back to my house and cried. And then when the wheat harvest started, right north of Dell City there, if you take Sooner Road, over there and uh, on the edge of Dell City, if you follow Sooner Road or Sunny Lane Road up there and you go out far enough, there's wheat farming out there. There was then. And it's good bottom land, great farming, good wheat land out there. And I'd go out there every day that week. I'd, I'd take me a sandwich and I'd go out there and set my car and watch the combines run and cry because I wasn't up there with my dad. I mean, this, somebody said, how could it be that big a deal? I, I don't expect you to understand. I'm just telling you it was. I mean, I, I wanted that so bad. And I'd, I'd listen to those combines come by, get close enough, Brother Jason, where I could smell the dust coming out, you know, thrashing and everything. And just the smell of it, the sound of the combines, the grinding of the wheat going through the cylinder and into the process. Of being, oh, man, everything about it, I wanted it so bad. And I sat there on the last day I watched him cutting wheat saying, I'll never do this again. I'll never do this again. And it just broke my heart. But I couldn't follow Jesus. And, and well, so, well, as your pastor, there's a problem. Actually, God probably used him to teach me a lesson. Look, son, I own your life. God wasn't mad at me because I love farming. But it would have been terrible if I'd have loved that more than I loved him. And if I'd have ruined an opportunity in ministry there where this man was giving me an opportunity, if I'd have ruined that by my own selfishness of saying, no, I want to run the combine. I want to be with my dad. I want to do this and I want to do that. You know what I had to do? Deny myself. I, it may be a silly illustration, but I'm just saying, you're going to have to live it out in your life. 
whatever it might be that's going to stand between you and being totally a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to have to say no to some of your self-ambitions and some of your desires and some of the dreams that you've had since you were very young. And now you can see the opportunity to have it, and you could, except for, except for what? Well, you've got to be at church, and I've got ministry responsibilities, or you might be in full-time ministry and your pastor is not very compassionate about your heart being somewhere else besides where you are. Are you listening to this? And if you're going to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, listen to me, then you're going to have to deny yourself. You may even have to say on the telephone, I'm sorry, Mom, I can't come. Now, I, I know it's the 49th family reunion in a row, or 50th. I, I know that. But mom, I have responsibilities, and it's the Lord's day. Yeah, but just one time, just going to be different. But it's the Lord's day. I even had to tell my own mother, mom, I'm not coming to the reunion. I can't. I work for the man. And besides that, I'm committed to serve the Lord. It's Sunday. Have the thing on Saturday. Amen. Well, that's everybody's day off, and then well, have it on Monday. Everybody goes to work. That's what's my day off. When I got it, I really didn't get it much, but I'm just saying. I'm, I, no, I'm just saying. I had to tell my own mother, no, Mom, I can't come. That's all I can say is, no, I won't be there. It's not that I don't want to be there. Mom, you know I love you and all of that. I, I want to be there, but I can't. Somebody said that's kind of a nitty, not that significant a deal, is it? Well, I, I don't know. If you don't handle those kind of issues, there are bigger ones coming, you know. If you don't get a handle on those smaller issues like that and learn what it is to say no to yourself, then you're going to fail in opportunity to do what he called you to do, and that is to serve him by ministering to people. Look at me. And ministering to people takes time. It takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes energy. Let me just kind of give you my schedule over at Dell City when I was associate pastor. Because it pretty much remained this way the first 15 years of ministry or 16. So I'd try to take Monday off. Now my pastor often had work to do on the place that he bought and we restored and all of that. So I was often to his house on Monday. My day off would be out there with him, not with my wife. And then our little child, when she was, the first one was born. So I'd be with him. I did not know how to tell him no. As a matter of fact, I don't even remember him giving the opportunity <laughs> to say yes or no. It's not like he said, you want to come out and work at my house, my dear, or you got other plans? Never, ever, ever, ever. Be at my house at 730. Yes, sir. So I did. And I can remember being out there on Monday. It's not I didn't love him, I did. And I know he loved me. He had strange ways of showing it sometimes, but I know he did. And, and so I was out there on Monday. I can't tell you how bad I would like to have just gone with my wife out to Lake Hefner and walk around Lake Hefner or something. That's a big body of water to me. I didn't know there was great big beer stuff and that. I didn't pay much attention to what was going on. I mean, I, I just, just to do something, go fishing. I can't, nope, I was out there. And then there were other times we were in building and remodeling projects and so forth. And I can remember the time I got in trouble when we had worked uh, starting on a Friday, had worked all the way to Saturday morning. So we had worked 24 hours. We were laying carpet, used carpet, in an old building where there wasn't one square room in it. They all had, you know, it was, it was poorly built. It was an old army barracks moved in. And we're putting down used carpet. Well, there all kinds of challenges there. And so the pastor came to the church at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we've been working all night. He came in and said, I don't know if you guys are going to get done by tomorrow or not, but we have to. You've got to get with it. He looked at his watch and said, why don't you go home? You can take a shower and eat some breakfast and come back. You get back here at 8 o'clock. Well, I lived on the property, so I went home right quick, took a shower. Sandra fixed me some breakfast, and I sat down in the chair, and she went on to do her business, and I woke up at 8.30. I went dashing over there. I thought I was going to get fired. I did. He said, this guy's been here longer than you have. He works harder than you do, which I 
seriously doubt that. But anyway, uh, he said he works longer and he's been here longer and he's older than you are and you couldn't be here by 8.30. I said, man, I just sat down. I meant to him. He said, well, and I got chewed up. I thought he was going to fire me right there on the spot. And then we worked all the way till about 10 o'clock Saturday night and then ran my bus route and everything on Sunday and taught the class. He told me when I went there, he said, you're starting an adult class. Now, Sam, you start this class with one couple. My wife and I were 20, just turning 22 years of age. She wasn't 22 yet, and I was, just turned 22. And he said, you're starting this class. And he said, you uh, are going to start. Nobody can come in this class that you didn't invite or you didn't find or you didn't reach. Nobody except this couple. And if in one year your class can't pay your salary, I don't need you here. That'll give you a burden right there. <laughs> now, the positive side is I didn't get paid much, so it didn't have to be huge offerings, you know. And so that was the deal. And uh, I can remember that our, our deal was we'd knock doors or do work around the church. We, we didn't sit around on computers. We didn't sit around planning. We didn't have planning meetings every three months and plan and organize and do all that stuff. But the church was growing. It was exploding. We went from about 450 when I went there to 900 in about two years. And people were getting saved and things were happening. My wife and I volunteered for a bus route. We, it was not a part of our job description. And he got up in the pulpit and said, we need two bus workers. It was the first month we were there, at the end of the first month. And I said to my wife, maybe you and I ought to work that bus route. She said, well, I could work one and you work the other. Apparently she didn't want to work with me. But anyway, uh, she said, I could work one, you could work the other. And I said, okay. Went and told her our pastor. And I said, she'll take the bus route and I'll take that other bus route. He said, you can't do it, Sandy. He said, you get, you're quiet. He said, I speak to you, and you get red blotches on your neck, and you look down, and you're too quiet. You've got to go meet strangers. And this, she said, I think I can do it. And I remember him saying, I just don't think you can do it. I said, well, she can't do much damage. The bus is averaging 10. So maybe we ought to let her try. He said, it's yours. For the next seven years, she had the biggest bus route. I chased her for seven years working a bus route. Never could catch her. Best bus worker I ever saw was my little wife. I worked a bus route, took that, and no, then I'd get called in, your bus route's down, your bus, what, wait a minute, it's not part of job, my job description. Well, you didn't dare tell him that. I didn't dare tell him that. No. Uh -uh. Were you afraid of him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't tell him that. And I can remember, then I'd, uh, so we'd do work on Tuesday, visit every Tuesday evening. Wednesday was office and work day and maybe even a little time for study. Thursday, again, was knocking doors. Thursday night, out visiting. Tuesday night, out visiting, following up on prospects. Thursday night, following up on prospects. Friday night, out following up on prospects after we did our own janitor work on Friday and then go out and follow up on prospects. I was out every Tuesday night, church Wednesday night, visitation Thursday night, and out uh, door knocking on Friday, did my bus route and my Sunday school class, started uh, the bus route in the morning, you know, after a bus meeting, and then I would visit my class till 7, 7.30 on Saturday evening, and that's how it went, week after week. I can't tell you how many times on Friday night I'd be out visiting, often by myself, and I'd be out visiting, and I would think, I would just, if I, I'm out Friday night, and it was the had Friday night in the big town. You know, people were running around, restaurants were full and everything. I just loved to take my wife out to eat on a Friday night. If we did, it had to be after 9 o'clock. And I remember thinking I'd go visit in homes. Oh, come in, Brother Sam. They weren't always happy to have you on Friday night. And so, I, come in, Brother Sam. Come in. I'd go in, visit, and I'm following up on prospects and all of that. And I'd go back and get in my car and said, man, I would enjoy a Friday like they're doing. They're getting ready to go out and eat, or they just did. They're together and like that. I remember thinking that. And I remember even hinting and suggesting that maybe I should have, you know, I'm supposed to get Monday off. Since I don't get Monday off, I wonder about taking Friday night off. I remember suggesting, I said, I've just been thinking about that. He shot it down that quick. No. You got to build that class. You got to do this, this. By the way, the class 
it, it was wonderful the way God blessed it and everything. But to see all of that and to see what happened and to be a part of the church growth and to be loyal to my pastor, I mean, I, 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 I was taught by my dad, it's yes or no, sir. When my dad told me what to do, he wasn't asking, what's your opinion, son? Are you okay with this? I never heard that. And that's the way my pastor was. You know what I said to him? Yes, sir. No, sir. Well, you wimp. No, he had authority. I'm working for him. My will really wasn't the most important thing to God or him. What was important to God is that I do what I'm told to do. And I'd have done anything the man told me to do, short of lying and, and making some kind of moral compromise or something. I'd do anything he said to do. Yeah, but didn't you want to do this? What I wanted to do didn't matter. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it's not about you fulfilling, well, here's what I think. Or was it, uh, I'm sick and tired of hearing situations out here where graduates and others from other schools and everything, they work with some pastor and they take issue with the pastor and the next thing you know it didn't work just because they're not willing to say no to their own will, their own desire, their own ambition. Nobody's going to treat me that way. Nobody's going to tell you, look, if you've got an issue, then go look the man in the eyeball and be a Christian about it and say, I know that you demand this and you demand this, and right now at this stage of my life, I don't want to hurt you, I don't want to hurt this church, I'm out of here. But you don't go running around whining and complaining and griping to somebody else and making it still all about yourself. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you've got to learn in the little issues of life and in the big issues of life that you say no to yourself. Amen. And you may be something and you may stay in the ministry and you may have a job and you may pick up a paycheck, but you're not a genuine follower of Jesus Christ if you don't know what it is to deny yourself. Disassociate yourself from your own wishes, your own will, your own desires, your own ambitions. You must. If you're going to follow Jesus. Oh, he has more to say. If a man love father or mother or brother or sister or wife or children more than me, he's not worthy of me. You know, Brother Sam, I've always wondered what that meant. Exactly what it says. Yeah, but I... No, you died, remember? Well, I... Well, you're not dead yet, huh? You got to say no to self, and you have to die to self to follow Jesus. Now, see, there are people in my family who don't understand. Jesus said, I'm not come to bring peace. This just messes up Christmas season for people all the time. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And devotion to me will separate a father and his son, a mother and her daughter, a mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law, which there's already issues there anyway, but I'm just saying. Jesus said, I will cause division between a father and a son, between a mother and a daughter and a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law, and because of devotion to me, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Now, he presented that as a possibility in following him. Now, do you want to follow Jesus? Well, I'm going to be in ministry, but, but what? Go on your own? A maverick minister for Jesus? Now, it would be a fake minister for Jesus. Because we're not really following Jesus unless we meet his demands. Amen. Yes, but see what the world is expecting out here. Their expectation is not important as his demands right. are important. Amen. 
And in the final analysis, we will not be judged by the opinion of humankind. We will be judged by the great potentate and king of kings and lord of lords, the only immortal Jesus Christ. You want to follow him? You don't have to. Well, what do you mean you don't have to? You don't have to. You can save yourself from it. But in verse 25, he said, you'll lose. You'll lose it. You'll lose the life I had for you. But if you lose yourself for my sake, you'll find it. You'll find it. Don't claim to be any great example of anything. I don't. But I can just tell you right now, my wife and I have had quite a bit of time to talk about it. Well, I guess even more since our 50th anniversary and then 50 years and trying to be in the full-time ministry, we talk about a lot of things and, and that we've experienced, that we've been through. Look at me just a second. We wouldn't trade the life he's given us for all the money in the world, all the, that whatever the world, we wouldn't trade the life God has given us for anything. She'll be here the next hour. You can ask her. We, we wouldn't. We wouldn't trade it for anything. Would you do anything different? Only to do it better, hopefully. Only to learn sooner. But no, we wouldn't trade it. Well, that's just not for me. Well, then you don't have to. But you lose what he would have had for you if you're willing to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. Well, what's that life supposed to be like? You have to ask. He's not the man I used to work for that was a pastor that was really tough and sometimes not very thoughtful. He's not like that. No man. He said no man is going to forsake houses and lands and family for my sake, but what he will be restored, not just with everlasting life, but an hundredfold in this life. You know what I say to those words? Amen, amen, amen. He is true to his word.